almost 20 years ago, but now it's the new reinvention of the semantic web in the right moment of AI, right? Um, so, uh, Jim has, uh, Jim was the recipient of the nine, uh, 1995 Fulbright Foundation Fellowship. He's also the former member of US Air Force Science Advisory Board. Is a fellow of AAAI, PCS, IEEE, and AAAS, and ACM. He has, wow, well, this, anyway, so. Let's really, skip know, the rest, yeah, <laughs> please. <laughs> so anyway, so anyway, so I will bring all my to have him here. Let, let's listen to his talk. Thank you. Thank you, Yang. So, so on one hand, I'm, I'm really flattered to be one of the first people to be kicking off this new auditorium of yours. On the other hand, there are still a few kinks being worked out. One of them being that the people out on the Zoom and the eventual recording can hear me on a microphone, but those of you in the room can't, so I'm just going to have to talk loud. And uh, I'll, I'll ask your forbearance. I actually was looking forward to using a mic today because I have a little bit of a sore throat, so I'll be going back to my water bottle a whole lot. <laughs> So um, the idea behind my talk today is I really want to look at sort of two directions of conversations that have to happen and neither of which I see happening in a big way. So we have what you might call the nouveau AI. And I'm going to talk about some of that at the beginning just to give sort of a, a, a introduction to people who come from sort of a traditional AI background. And then we have sort of the traditional AI which is sort of ignoring the nouveau AI. So you go to the KDD conference and everyone wants to talk about deep learning, which is great because there's some great stuff happening there. But for example, Judah Pearl came to talk about sort of some of the scientific aspects of that and sort of how it could talk to Bayesian networks and into inferencing and reasoning. And almost no one came to his talk because that was just that other stuff. And meanwhile, at IJCHI and, and AAA and things like that, the DL talks aren't getting nearly the audiences they get at the other conferences. So we have a conversation that's not happening. And what my goal is today is really, in some ways, it's more of a talk about what we need to be doing than what we are doing. Although, since I first started giving this talk, people said, okay, give us some examples. So I've got some students working it. So towards the end, I'll show you some relatively new, like one of them came in at two o'clock this morning, results that show at least that there may be some promise in this, in some promising directions to look at. That's where I'm gonna to try to go today. Um, I have a publisher who says I'm not allowed to give any talks unless I show this cover of this book, but also a number of the things that are in the uh, talk today are actually in a book I did um, with my colleague Alice Mulvihill, so I know some of you in the room know her. Um, and that's available and that's really sort of a introduction to AI for people who aren't technical specialists but it does cover both sides of the field and sort of say why you need some of it so this talk came from you know I was I was asked to give a keynote at IJCHI and someone who had read the book said you know what would be really nice is if you could sort of do what the book did and talk about putting the stuff together so so to kind of summarize where we're going, there's several AI technologies, and there's really more than one. So we tend to talk a lot about deep learning and forget that it's also built on top of a couple of other key technologies. Um, and essentially, when you have an exponential growth, there's sort of this knee in the curve. So when you're here, it seems like nothing's happening, and then it starts to accelerate, and all of a sudden, it things like seem, seems like things are going very fast, and then sooner or later it may level off or keep going, whatever. So I would say that the three that have really hit the knee in the curve, one is deep learning. One is, I use Watson here, but really what I'm talking about there is a lot of the associative word network stuff and semantic web, and particularly the implementation of knowledge graph and linked data approaches. So we see all of those really starting to take off now, get heavy usage, right? Now, the traditional AI knowledge representation and things like that, you don't hear as much about in these contexts. And so I'm going to talk about why we have to keep that in mind, why we can't just throw that stuff out, and I'll give you mostly examples, and then how these can come together, and what are some of the challenges of putting them together, and then what are some things we might be able to do about it. So I'm just going to very quickly kind of review what some of these technologies are 
on the sort of new side, and I suspect most of you who are students know these quite well. But so the first one is deep learning. Deep learning is really a outgrowth of the neural network approach that was, um, is actually, so about 30 years ago, so, so neural networks has a funny history. What will happen is uh, something will get started, someone will prove it can't work. So most people will get out of the field and a few people will try to overcome that, that problem. About 20 years later, suddenly they overcome that problem and then there's a whole new flourish until somebody proves something again. And so, the, so the most famous of these was first of all, the early days of neural networks, you had something called perceptron model. It was just a two layer network. And it was essentially proved that a lot of things that people were showing it was learning, it wasn't really learning, right? So um, a very famous example is you had pictures of missiles and pictures of tanks because the military was funding this. Thing was great at telling missiles from tanks. But then when it was proved it couldn't possibly be doing that correctly, Somebody actually showed it a black piece of paper and it said, oh, that's a tank. And they showed it a white piece of paper and they said, it's a missile. Because it turned out all the missiles were, were filmed up against the sky and all the tanks were fil filmed down from against the ground. Okay, so now, of course, everyone said, oh, that stuff was all terrible, blah, blah, blah. And, and there was a proof that these two-layer networks couldn't do it. But there was a, a conjecture in that proof that, and if you added more layers, it wouldn't matter, okay? Cut to about 1987, 1988, what happens is it, it, it's finally proven that actually if you have those middle, that middle layer, so if you go to a three-level model, you can learn those functions. So the conjecture was wrong. Okay? And then there was a big birth of stuff in neural networks, except what happened was you had a scaling problem. And the scaling problem was essentially it was proved that if you had a, a, a multi-level network, so if you had a 10-level network, you could reduce it to a three-level network mathematically. More things. So, so once you were at the level limits of a three-level network, you were essentially, you know, done, right? And three-level networks had scaling issues, getting into very big problems, a lot of the problems we're seeing today. What turned out to be wrong in that proof is it only makes sense if, if the networks are fully connected. So if you have asymmetries, if you have different things you're doing, if you have recursive parts of the network, so things can feed back. If you have multiple network, different networks feeding into a network downstream, what are called convolutional networks. So a whole lot of people kept working on this stuff for a while, and some of the big names now, Jan LeCun, um, oh gosh, um, Toronto, <laughs> Jeff, Jeff, um, Jeff, yeah, Jeff Hinton. I've known Jeff since 1985. I don't do names well anymore, I'm sorry. Uh, so, so Jeff, uh, you know, Benjia came along. So they pulled together a lot of this stuff and now these things are doing phenomenal things and there's a whole new growth going on in this. And so a lot of, um, the other thing is, the other problem with making these things work was you needed a lot, there's still the supervised networks, so you have to train them, you say, Here's a lot of examples. Now try to categorize new things, right, against those examples, so in the same domain. So if I showed you a whole lot of pictures of cats and a whole lot of pictures of ducks and asked you to tell cats from ducks, right, and really you would do lots and lots of things. So ImageNet was a project going on to test um, vision systems. And so WordNet was a, a thing which had lots and lots of what are called sensors. So it said, there's a thing called an animal and an animal has a thing called a bird and a thing called a mammal and birds include ducks and this and that and mammals include cats and dogs and things. And they, so these guys got pictures of all of those things. So, so you needed a new kind of network and you needed a lot of stuff to feed it. And with the growth of the internet, the web and these kind of image sets, what, what really the big change was, I don't think I have the slide now. So in um, <clears throat> early, early in the 2000s, you had, so what happened is this image net is hand um, annotated. So you have a ground truth, right? And what would happen is you would test systems against that. So you were really, you would you'd show people a bunch of these pictures and you would show your vision system a bunch of these pictures and said, what is this a picture of? And then you would compare the output and in um, about 2007, 2008, you started to see the machine ones coming up 
And at this point, so, or I think it was uh, 2011, you had, for the first time, the machines were outperforming the people. And now, on these kind of tested limit sets, the machines are doing much better. And lots of other kinds of learning. So this, this technology has mostly been done for signals. So vision is the most famous example, but also speech, other kinds of um, streaming data, things like that. So here's just a uh, example of some of the stuff that's been happening in the past couple years. So this would be how the image labeling works. So this says, looking at that picture, we'll come back to this one again later. Um, the, you can see there's a dog, a child, the child is labeled person, and chair. And often, often people at this point would show you the ones that it gets wrong. So these are certainly nowhere near 100%, but they're still doing quite well. And certainly better than most AI people would have predicted a few years ago that vision systems could do. Okay, so it's the ability to recognize these kind of things in, in pictures that's really pushed things forward. Okay, another big thing happened around 2011, which is IBM, starting a few years before that, launched a big project to say, could we do question answering in a new way? Could instead of this very careful, handcrafted information, a system like Psych, could we really just harness all that stuff out there? So um, I think I'm not gonna go through the technical parts of this, but Watson, so the Watson system that IBM came up with, right, really uses what you would call associative knowledge. So the fast way to think about that is I get a question, so, so Watson was originally built for question answering, went for, to Jeopardy question answering. In fact, the, um, a story that hasn't been told outside of IBM much is how, how, how this kind of came into being. So IBM had this huge question answering group funded for years by DARPA and other agencies. And, you know, they were actually the state, one of the top groups. But um, one of the IBM vice presidents was in a restaurant eating dinner. And, and this part of the story has been told that um, uh, at one point, about 7.30 in the evening, everybody got up and went out to the bar. The guy said, what's going on? And he went to look, and it was when Ken Jennings, the famous Jeopardy player, was in his streak. It was like the 57th game of the streak, right? And IBM periodically likes to do something really impressive, like beat the world chess champion or things like that. So this guy came back, called in the guy who headed up their question answering and said, I want you to beat that guy at Jeopardy, right? And of course, everyone said, can't do it, can't do it, can't do it. And the guy who was doing it, um, Dave Ferrucci, who ended up heading the Watson Project, came up with an idea. So he said to, the, to his deep question answering group, you guys are going to you know, play Jeopardy at the end of the summer. Just do as best you can. And then he took one incoming intern. <laughs> told that guy, I want you to do this, and you're not allowed to use any of the, the IBM technology. Just do it with whatever you can find open source and out on the web, right? And at the end of the summer, the interns program beat the standard program. Now, now that makes sense, because what happened was any question in a domain that the handcrafted system knew about, it wasn't hand, it had a lot of learning, to, but, you know, it, it knew certain domains really well. So if the questions were in that area, it got it right, but it couldn't answer anything else. The guy from the web was able to get some shot at almost everything. So they both played very bad Jeopardy, but they played very differently. But the, the web one convincingly beat the other one. So they decided maybe we can try to take these new ideas and bring them into playing Jeopardy. So Jeopardy, I expect most of you know, you get it. You get an answer and you have to generate a question, but that's just a gimmick. So you get, you get something said, um, you know, he was the president in 1927. And then you would have to say who was whoever was the president that year. Okay, uh, so associative knowledge. And it turned out that they built a lot of different heuristics, special categories needed for that stuff, but mostly you could take things like Wikipedia and stuff like that because for Jeopardy, the whole idea is humans write the questions and they design, they're carefully designed so when you're watching the TV show, 
you should feel like you know the answer, but not be able to come up with it as fast as the people on the show. And actually, it's even more complicated than that because they want you to sort of feel like you're winning early in the game and then feel like the people on TV are smarter than you by the end of the game. Okay. So, so IBM did, in fact, end up using that technique, playing against the two best Jeopardy champions ever and beating them convincingly. And if I had another hour of talk or if anyone wants to come ask me about Jeopardy later, fascinating stuff behind the scenes in here. Um, I was lucky enough to know some of the technology beforehand. I wasn't there at the game. I had to watch it with everyone else. But, um, but I've worked with the IBM group thereafter and heard a lot of interesting anecdotes, things like that. But I also went question by question through the game. I watched, you know, what's really fascinating is it, it was a two-game series. The first game, the computer clobbered the humans. The second game, Ken started changing his strategy working differently, and actually was at a point where if two things had gone differently, he could have won, right? So, so, so it was much, much closer than it looks from the final scores, and it really was a wonderful example of a human learning differently than a computer, but we won't go there. Okay. So again, so strategic change, the computer could only play Jeopardy one way. Ken started saying, you know, I can only win if I always buzz in first, regardless of what the question is. And then I'll try to answer it. Because I'm better off getting a few wrong than letting the computer always get them right. The other thing interesting, I'm sorry, this was the talk I wasn't going to give. Then the other interesting thing is it turns out a lot of the times when Ken beat Watson with the right answer, Watson had the wrong answer. So if, if Ken had been slower, Watson would have done worse. It still would have won, but it would have been a very close game. So, but it was still a convincing victory because pretty much every AI person asked at the end of 2010, who's going to win a Jeopardy match against Ken Jennings? <laughs> Bet on Ken, right? Um, third one is the semantic web. That's the article Ying mentioned. And you really see the semantic web play out nowadays through something called the knowledge graph. And so this is the easiest way to show it, to show you that I'm not talking about some laboratory technology that nobody's using in any real way. So this is a Google search, and if you type, how tall is Tom Cruise, you get an answer, you get his comparison to some other people, you get this box on the side that tells you about Tom Cruise, and it's actually, that box is the things it thinks are the most interesting related ones. So if you went to my page, you wouldn't get movies and profiles, you'd get books and other people who uh, my search, and then you have the normal Google searches after it. So that sidebar on Google is being presented from information that it derives from associations of searches and search results and things like that. I'll talk more about that later. This is the Facebook open graph. So Facebook is also using this, this technique, and they actually built it. Um, some of it use, so all of these things use a lot of different technologies behind them, but the primary thing they're using here is this connectedness between things. So concept to concept, concept to person. So for Facebook, it's this person like this thing, this person is friend to this. So a lot of the social network analytics you see nowadays are coming off of, the, uh, off of unlabeled graphs, uh, Twitter analytics and things like that. This is more off of labeled graphs. And those labels become really crucial when you're doing simple search, simple question answering. So basically, you're trying to identify an entity. Uh, that's another example. Um, so, so Google, this was actually, this is actually a little out of date. So at, um, at the time that I made this slide, Google's knowledge graph was, knowledge vault they call it, and there's actually an API to their open one had over a billion facts in it. So the fact is just a link between any two things. So that's not a billion things it knows about, it's a billion things it knows about uh, those. I, I use, they haven't released the numbers and there's no easy way to crawl it or walk it. Yeah, they renamed it. So, so um, there's been some changes. I'm getting, ah, there we go. Something was buzzing. Um, so the, oh, it's, I know what it is. This guy's drilling upstairs. Yeah. yeah. I can't, I can't make that go away. Sorry. I'll just talk louder. Um, so, so again, so they've, they've released different, um, 
thing. The other, the other big thing I don't have, actually maybe I do later. Um, yeah, so, so again, so what's happening here is you're using this relatedness of entities. So very simple, those of you who've taken an AI course, very, very early on you learned about something called a semantic net. And then later semantics nets became inference systems and much more complex. This is really going back to the early semantic nets. They do very little inferencing. It's really just connectivity patterns, right? With a lot of graph analytics. Okay, so in summary, these things have really done some very powerful things that people, again, just five, 10 years ago would have bet you couldn't do. So deep learning, the neural learning from data has very high quality. The results are imperfect, but they're not you know, drastically imperfect, okay? So, so again, a lot of people who criticize these networks will find the things it does wrong, adversarial problems, for those of you who know what that is. Uh, you know, there's, there's a famous one of a kid holding a toothbrush and it says a person with a baseball bat. I've seen that one, you know, at every talk criticizing it. And it was, you know, one mistake on a system that outperformed humans, right? So they don't show you the same thing. Now, on the other hand, you see things like video question answering and things where they claim to have very high things. So it says, what is the woman holding? And it gets it right. But you show them a picture of an airplane landing and you say, what is the woman holding? And it actually says, plane, sky. So you realize the the language and the vision haven't been well integrated. And that, so a lot of the pro, one of the problems is just how you test these things. So when I say imperfect results, what I'm really saying is not only errors, but that we really don't know the bounds of the learning of these things. We're still early days of really understanding, in a sense, an engineering discipline of deep learning. Uh, Watson, again, associative learning from data, again, high quality but imperfect results. And the semantic web, a lot of graph links from information extraction, clustering and learning, et cetera. So, so once upon a time, the term good old fashioned AI was, was created. And actually was talking primarily about very logical reasoning. Here, I just mean the stuff prior to all this stuff, okay? So, so a lot of the people in, in, in kind of the traditional AI field are saying, we can just ignore this stuff because of the imperfections. Right? When they get it right, come back and talk to us. But, um, oops. but in fact, when you look at it from the other side of you, there are some interesting issues here. So like that knowledge graph that we show you, you're often told it comes from learning. This is a slide Peter Norvig presented, uh, Google's research director at uh, a conference in um, April 16. And Peter showed sort of what, what they do to try to put together their big knowledge graph. And includes a fact-based to seed it, and that comes from something called schema.org, which again, I would talk about if I had another whole talk. Um, natural language extraction, probabilistic learning, active learning, and then this little one in the middle called human judgments. So in fact, none of these things are working yet and being deployed in, in, in the practice of a place like a Google or, or these other search engines uh, without going through humans helping to do the training, finding results that didn't work right, things like that. And here's my, one of my favorite examples that really helps both show why you need the human, but also what's wrong. This is, uh, Google hasn't released its bad results. Yahoo, through a guy named Peter Mika, who really is, is the father of the knowledge graph. I mean, he's really the person who said, you know, we could take semantic web to search by reducing some of the expressivity, really scaling it up, getting, getting a lot of webmasters, using the learning, et cetera. Um, and so Peter was behind what eventually became schema.org. Guha at Google is the one who really brought it into Google. And so those two between them really get a lot of the credit for making this stuff real. But Peter has shared some of his examples, and this is from a talk he gave in 2014. So this is a picture, uh, you know, so each page, you know, these are those little knowledge boxes. And this is the information about the, the famous painter Michelangelo, and you can say it has Michelangelo, commonly known, was an Italian sculptor, that's all right. And when he was born and when he was died, and his parents, all sorts of good information, there's his photo. Now, now most of you have probably figured out by now that that's not a photo of the Italian artist, right? For those of you who don't know, so, so some of you probably know, that's the photo of a teenage ninja mutant turtle named Michelangelo, right? 
And there were four of these Teenage Mutant, nerd, bleh, teenage mutant Ninja Turtles named Michelangelo, Raphael, Donatello, and Leonardo. So they were all named after famous Renaissance artists. So in fact, if you go to the web and use associative knowledge, this is a much, much better choice for a photo of Michelangelo. Because it, it, it associates in the knowledge graph much, much more uh, than, 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 <clears throat> than the actual painter does. And then there's many other issues too. So you have questions like, um, um, you know, wrong associations, things like that. Let me, let me skip ahead a little. So, so, so the question is, what kind of knowledge would help you fix these problems if you were trying to do this? So, so again, so what they're doing now is a human looks at this and laughs and says, that's wrong, right? And then they go back and they do some debugging and they try to figure out how to turn it off and they say, okay, we need a human field. And if it's a human field, then the picture has to be from a category, you know, so we won't take pictures arbitrarily from the web. We'll only take them. Uh, a lot of the early problems they had was, you know, these things obviously are going to reflect web biases, right? Um, and there's lots of examples of, you know, sort of, if, so, so I am certainly not the most famous person with my last name, but I've been on the web long enough that I'm, I'm usually the top. I used to be able to say I'm the top hit. Now the problem is because of personalization, I may or may not be the top hit. But for the verbatim results, I'm still the top hit. But certainly there's a lot of people more famous than me. But on the web, I've just been around longer, right? I have more pages that are linked together. So it's still using page rank and that. So again, you need people to also do some of that. Those of you who are statisticians or, or, or look at that kind of thing, a lot of the biases of what's on the web show up in the results if you're not careful. So you have to think about issues like that. So um, a, famous, a favorite example from a few years ago, if you searched on the world is flat and you searched on the world is round, world is flat got orders of magnitude more Google hits than world is round. Mainly because there was a, a famous book at the time called the world is flat, right? So it wasn't really comparing flat world theories versus round world theories and what people believe. It was that book name was biasing the data. You had to break things like that. So, so a lot of these things are what traditional AI has been about. So, Many years ago, uh, in a famous article, and the article site is at the bottom of the page, which we can't see on the Zoom. Um, so it's three guys at MIT, Howie Schrobe, uh, Peter Solovich, and I, Peter Solovich, and I forget the third author, um, had this definition of why you needed what we call knowledge representation. So, so notice all of the three big things that have happened over the past years we could almost call knowledge free. The way they get their information is from tag stuff, from association. So it's a kind of learning, it's a kind of knowledge, but it's not, you know, sort of, quote, reasoning, okay? And I'll, I'll go through a couple of these, but so one thing is that knowledge representation is fundamentally a surrogate, a substitute for the thing itself used to enable, and I'll, I'll, I'll describe what that means for those who are, you know, I mean, this is pretty dense language, but um, essentially we can think about things without having to have them with us, right? You don't have to be seeing the direct inputs like a neural net does to be able to reason about the outputs, right? So for a lot of the current learning systems and things like that, we don't have a way to sort of say, okay, you know, yesterday you saw pictures of car and you labeled car. What are the features of car? Tell me something about cars. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, I'm going to skip the second one about what ontologies are. Uh, it has to do with theories of reasoning. So, so again, one of the problems is if, 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 if we want to understand the terms being used in a domain, we need to know what those terms are. And we were just talking a couple minutes ago, you know, when you get into, you know, when you're down in genomics, the terms are very precise. When you're up to human disease, you know, what is type two diabetes? It's not something, it, it, it's kind of got an agreed upon major part, but to actually define it technically, or, or an example that might be closer to home for some of you, what is a robot? Okay, so the, um, the IEEE years ago came up with a 10 
sort of 10 features that define a robot. So it turns out, if you say anything with any of these features, your thermostat is a robot. If you say it has to have all 10 of these features, there are no robots actually yet developed that are actually robots. Okay, I think there may be one or two now in the modern day. So, so again, so the 10 is too strict uh, as, as an intersection, uh, as a union, and it's too not strict enough as an intersection. So, so what is a robot? Well, we all pretty much know one when we see one and would argue maybe around some of the fringe cases. But again, defining these things is very difficult. And if you're going to really do technical analytics with these things, you need to be able to bound these things or at least know when you're outside the boundaries, which I'll talk about later. And then it's a medium of human expression, a language in which we say things about the world. And then I think, and, and Katya and I have had this conversation before, that's where I think a lot of people miss the fact that if we want the machines to learn stuff, that's fine. If we want the machines to learn stuff and interact with us, it's a different story. And so I'm going to go through these a little bit. Um, now, this is my favorite story. I go through it. I worked into about half my talks. Um, it's a cute kid story. So my daughter's first two words were cat and duck. And there was a period in her life where everything was either a cat or a duck. And, you know, she'd look at certain people and say, cat. And she'd look at certain people and say, duck. And, and, and it didn't last long enough. And my daughter is now 30, finishing up her PhD in linguistic anthropology. So she knows a lot more words now than cat and duck. But, um, oh, man, it would be better if we could see the bottom. But, but here's the thing, okay? If I'm just training something to tell cats from ducks, right? So I take my dog and I train it to do cats from ducks, and I take my friend and you know a human or a deep learning system, and cats from ducks. So behind that bush, there's something. Is it a cat or a duck? Well, the dog gets it right every time. The person's still struggling. And again, I can show you pictures which would be sort of ambiguous, where the dog would have no problem and the person did it. So so essentially. The thing that's trained in certain ways is doing extremely well, right? But then I called my daughter, uh, this was when I was writing the book, so this was about a year and a half ago, and I said, Sharon, how would you explain the difference between a, a duck and a cat? Right? And she said, oh, daddy, you're not going to tell that story again. And I said, no, I'm putting the story in my book. Take me, you know, just do for me, if you were telling it to a child, what would you say? And she said, okay, if I was telling it to a kid, I'd probably say something like, the cat has fur and four legs and goes meow, the duck is a bird and it swims and it goes quack. And I think you'd all agree that's not a terrible starting place for trying to explain the difference between a cat and duck. Okay? If you ask your dog to explain the difference between a cat and duck, remember, your dog is better at telling them apart, it, it doesn't have the symbolic abilities to turn it. So it's not a language problem, the dog says woof, the dog can't woof the right pattern, right? It, it doesn't, or at least we believe, it doesn't have the mental, um, what word do I want? It doesn't have the stuff in here that we have that lets, it has a lot of stuff we have, and, and, we, and, and it has stuff we don't have, like it, it's much more sensitive nasal aspects, but we have stuff it doesn't have, and it's, that's what we usually call symbolic reasoning, and turning something like that into, into, into language is, is really important. So, so first question is, you know, if, if you wanted to have a discussion with someone about, with a computer about cats and ducks, you kind of got to understand whether by cat it means the things you mean by cat and to not, some way to do it. So, so looking at this notion of what's called surrogate knowledge, the idea is that you want to be able to reason about these things when they're not, when they're not present. So again, I, 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 I use the example in, in some other talks. You wake up in the morning and your car isn't working. What do you do? And, and lots of different options depending on what's going on that day and how you solve it. And you know, my classes can take 20 minutes and come up with dozens of different solutions. But then I say, how many of you had to bring a car in here and break it to figure out that solution? Right? You're doing it in your mind. right? So that's that notion of surrogate. Or here's some simpler example. I showed you this picture before. <clears throat> and I can ask a question like, okay, so there's the person, the dog, and the chair. Which one can you sit in, right? And it turns out it's actually pretty easy. All of these techniques I've been talking about 
word association and knowledge graph and things like that would probably pick the person, uh, the chair. Chair is the one you sit in, okay? However, it turns out it would probably also have a fairly high error bar around dog because dog and sit show up quite a lot together, okay? What if I said, what is most likely to bite what? Okay, so most people would say, well, the dog's likely to bite the chair. Uh, the dog's likely to bite the kid. The dog's likely to bite the, bite the chair. The kid's likely to bite the chair. The kid could bite the dog, but, you wouldn't, but almost no one would say the sh chair would bite the kid or the chair would bite the dog. Okay? Now, that's not because you don't find examples of chairs not biting people on the web. So if you look at the web, you don't see a lot of pictures of dogs biting chairs or kids biting chairs. You have some knowledge that says, you know, animate things bite things and not inanimate don't. So, so the notion of a chair biting something would have to be metaphoric, right? If someone said, you know, I sat in my chair and it bit me, you would understand we don't really mean it's closing a mouth with teeth, but it had some other action. So, so we're able to do a lot of that stuff. And I know it sounds pretty silly when I say that, but again, these systems, that's a harder question to answer correctly but you could still get it out of sort of the Jeopardy type stuff, okay? Which one is most likely to become a computer scientist someday? All of these systems would pretty much come up with, you know, a, per, a computer scientist is a person, um, this thing is a person, so that's the one that wins, right? But if I then ask you, how would they go about doing it? So you're a parent, you have a kid who's that age, and you want them to grow up to be a computer scientist, God forbid. Uh, what would you do, okay? Or if I ask you, some of you are in the process of becoming computer science, PhDs at, at informatics, et cetera, right? What do you need to do? You know, you're working on your thesis. What are you gonna have to do to finish your thesis? You're not, you're, you're able to answer questions like this. Those take, a, you're not using like a little recurrent network that's, that's reasoning ahead a few steps. You're somehow, you have processed that stuff into complex knowledge that says, you know, to get out of here, I'm going to have to defend a thesis, and to defend a thesis, I have to do a proposal, I have to have this level of research, and to do that kind of research, I work with it. You could generate stuff like that, and then you could go back, and you could actually write an essay about how this kid... The current systems, if you ask them this question, the only way they could really answer it is if they found some, you know, essentially they found a search that had a question which says, how do you grow up to become a computer scientist? Or how do you write a doctorate? But, but to put all those things together and to process them together and to turn them into a plan, right? And I mean, even something like, how are you gonna get home from here tonight? How are you gonna get home from here this afternoon if your car doesn't start? How are you gonna home, get home from here if it snows again, right? All of those kind of things. We're really great at people. And that's what a lot of the old fashioned AI was, was focused on, was answering those kind of questions, because those were the things that really computers were having a lot of trouble with and still do, even in this day of nouveau a AI. And, and we can make it even harder. Which one of these would you save if the house was on fire? So when I ask this question, I usually get the same answer from people unless they're being funny, which is, you know, most people would say, I rescue the person. I feel bad about the dog tech with the chair, right? And of course, I always have somebody in the audience says, what if it's a really valuable chair? And I say, you're never babysitting for my kid, <laughs> right? In fact, would you use a robot babysitter if you didn't know in advance which of these three possibilities it would choose if the house was on fire, right? So that's, again, this notion of not only do we need to train these things, but we need to know what they're going to do. So if you look at the whole emerging fields of ethics of computing, accountable computing, things like that. Right now, it's very hard to look inside these neural networks, to look inside these associative networks, and to say, what's going on, right? So if we want to be able to really use the products of these in much more complex systems, again, a clinician told by a learning system to give this patient this disease, uh, this, 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 this treatment, wants to know why. And, and typically wants to know why from what guideline that won't get me sued, but that's another issue, right? So why will it make them better? Why is it okay for me to do it? Things like that. Those are important questions, right? So the fact that the correlative nature says it might work is useful, is useful information, but it's not sufficient, okay? Let me change the story the other way, right? And again, I'm going to simplify this a lot. 
Now you're somebody who, now that I've convinced you, we got to think a little bit about this so that there's a reason for all this old fashioned knowledge representation stuff. Well, okay, here's where I start beating up on my team, right? So, so in a sense, a lot of the traditional knowledge representation and AI work was based on the assumption. So, so you would say to somebody, well, you know, you're looking at a visual scene and you're just representing it symbolically. You're just telling me what's true. Right? Shouldn't you be using a vision system for that? And for years, our AI was able to say, get me a vision system that's good enough to tell the difference, and then I'll worry about it. Well, you know what? We now have vision systems that are good enough to tell the difference, and most people still aren't worrying about it. So number one is sort of, we've, we've represented the world in a symbolic form and then did symbolic manipulations to it. But now we have systems that are strong enough on the visual end to they're not really representing a symbolic form quite yet, but they're certainly, uh, you know, complex enough to say, hey, that's a car, you know, again, they're driving a car, right? The, the entire suite of things are sitting there and the car is not hitting things and is driving better than a human in a lot of situations. Turned out recently, snow is a problem. Uh, so turn, turns out a lot of the things that were trained in, in uh, California, they had not actually taken up into the mountains. So there's now a whole bunch of people up in North Dakota and South Dakota who are testing self, you know, using learning and self-driving cars so that it'll be safer for you guys if that happens and you have a Tesla. Um, so, so AI was based on some kind of grounding in what we call a model theory with some notion of truth and false, right? But the problem is these current systems are not giving you something that says that's a person, right? They're actually saying, I'm fairly highly certain that that's a person. It might also be something else. It might also be something else. So you technically get a range of potential answers. And then you use a threshold or a best model. Um, so, so you say, okay, so these things give you a number. Well, we know how to do probabilistic reasoning. Right, so just put those um, numbers into our old Bayesian networks and we're in great shape, except it turns out that these deep learning systems and associative systems, the numbers they come out with are not probabilities, right? So when you see something and it says, it looked, you know, you show it the picture and it says, dog 91, ostrich 17, uh, you know, cat 12. Right? That just means it thinks it's a dog more than it thinks it's the other things. It doesn't mean it's 91% certain that it's a dog or that if you normalize, people tried that right away. You normalize them to one and feed that into the next system. Problem is each of the features in that system is learning a different complex curve, right? And you're learning a complex manifold over all this. And I'm really impressed that I can say that because I don't know what it means. I just sat through a lecture by a guy who really understood this stuff and showed all the math and why it works and why it doesn't work and where the problems are. And it's essentially, but basically, you're, you're, you're composing a set of different functions against a function that you don't know. So each level is, as it were, composing functions below it, the, 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 the numbers. And so as a result, there's not really a place you can touch and say, this is how you make what it thinks about this feature mathematically similar to what it thinks about this feature mathematically, unless we could get inside these things in a way we, we can't now. And same thing with associative knowledge. We get numbers which have to do with how often did these co-occur or what are the different situations things occur, occur in, but they're not probabilistic. Uh, we're also, you know, we have things like constraint, constraint satisfaction, uh, find an, uh, uh, an interpretation. So all of these things essentially ground in symbols or in numbers that are essentially symbolic. So Bayesian was a big step forward because you didn't need true or false. You could have numbers, but those numbers had to match real probabilities, right? So, so again, so this is the way that a lot of traditional AI viewed the world. So now we want to implement these KR systems on top of neural networks and associative learners, right? What is the issue? Well, the number, again, I just said this. So the numbers are not probabilities and they don't necessarily ground in human meaningful symbols. So even where we can pull out some of what we're finding in the middle of these systems, um, you're not getting things that are easy to name. So like you can see all of the visual fe features 
that some of these face recognizing systems use to recognize faces. But if you look at them, you'd say, oh, that's an ear, that's an eye, no clue what that is, that might be something about an eyebrow, right? The systems have learned what works for them, not what works for us, or at least not what we symbolically say works for us. So again, if I'm going back to that issue of how do I know whether to believe what it said if it can't explain what's going on in that middle level, right? A lot of the associations and the associative systems are by clustering. So we say this word shows up a lot with these other words, but I still don't know which of those is the meaningful word. What, what is that cluster? And you know, a lot of examples of doing this where you give words that are associated heavily and you say to a human, what are these? And if I said Ford, Chevy, Cadillac, you'd say, oh, those are cars, right? But there's others where I would take the learned ones and you'd look at them and say, no clue, right? Well, again, if we're gonna get these conversations going, we need them. So, so the question I, I, I started asking conceptually, and I'm gonna finish with some real short stuff some of my students are starting to do to see if we can at least play with this a little bit, is can we avoid throwing out, as it were, the reasoning baby with this grounding method? So we got it. So if we're going to use the current systems at the bottom of AI systems or, or at the front end or whatever way you want to look at it. So I'm going to take what's coming out of my vision system. And I'm going to feed it to some kind of planning system. I'm going to take what's coming out of my associative learning system. I'm going to hand it off to some kind of librarian system that's going to organize information. We need the planning systems. We still want to be able to define rules. So again, I don't want to keep testing and testing and testing the robot until finally it saves the baby, right? I really want to tell it when it's a choice between the baby and the dog, pick the damn baby, right? Uh, if any of you saw the iRobot movie, right, the whole reason the, the, um, the uh, Will Smith, yeah. <laughs> I can do names. I just need a little help, like the name. Anyway, um, so so the reason he gets mad is the ca a car drives off. He's in there with the with the uh, with his kid. The robot saves him instead of the kid. He says it's the robot. You know why do you do that? And the robot gives him a very good logical explanation. You know there was an eighty seven percent chance I could save you and a forty six percent chance I could save the kid. And da da da. The the, the parent is still you should have saved tried for the kid. Right? Better both of us should have gone while you were trying to save my kid than you saved me. Right? Turns out some of these are cultural. There's a lot of really interesting things in here, but we're not going to go there. So if you, if, if you said, <clears throat> if I had actually done that same question and it was your mother and your wife, you actually get <clears throat> different answers in the Occidental world from the Oriental world uh, that's been tested by ethicists and things like that. And, these things get at very subtle. Those of you who've heard about trolley problems. Thing. I mean, so there's whole fields of how do, how do people reason about this stuff. And if we're just going to take a learned system and say, you learn what you want and we hope it's going to come out right, well, we need to know what come out right needs. We need to know what we're looking for. So the, a whole field of accountability is growing around this stuff. And then the point I really want to make is, and we want to be able to interact with and understand these systems. So again, if my car is driving itself, I don't really need it to be telling me you know, I'm, I'm changing the speed a little bit here and I'm doing this. But if it decides to take a different route, maybe I'd like it to sort of say, you know, um, traffic has changed ahead. We're going to go a different way, right? At the moment, I'd like to tell my car where to take me. I don't want to just step in and say, take me somewhere, right? So the autonomous vehicles we talk about are autonomous drivers. They're not autonomous get you places things, right? Things like that. So, so again, so even if the computers don't need the symbolic stuff, that's what we use and how we communicate. So if I gave this talk in a bunch of symbols that you couldn't understand, you'd get even less out of it than you're getting today. Right. So, so I'm going to skip some of this. These are some of the things that we've been looking at. So um, one of the things that's very interesting in human understanding and this has been pretty reliably shown and it gets to some of the stuff for those of you who know be behavioral economics the fast reasoner and the slow reasoner and all these type one theories and things like that so um <clears throat> if i ask you how you would do something you'll give me an answer and it can generally be and then i say how and you'll give me an explanation you know how did you come up with that you'll give me an explanation 
you can pretty reliably show that it would take longer to generate that explanation than it took to give the answer. So it's pretty clear people use some kind of very fast way of sort of associating this stuff and pulling out the right answer, but then they can kind of put that answer back through their symbolic system, right? But it's, it's also not quite that clean. It's not like you come up, because there is reasoning that goes on. The fMRI show different parts of the brain for different questions. But, so no one really knows how we do this. But what we do know is that a lot of the time, you have some kind of way that um, <clears throat> you get the answer and then you go into a different system or at least reuse the knowledge in a different way to justify it. So that's one of the things that we think is a really interesting thing. You, so your deep learner says it's a cat, and now you want to say, why is it a cat? You'd like something that would kind of go back into the system to pick some features, take those features over into your symbolic definitions and say, oh, I think it's a cat because it meows and it has fur and it four legs, okay? Um, reasoning systems that know some of their axioms may simply be wrong, right? This is actually something that, and, and I'll show you, we're, we're just starting to get some good results on this. Literally at two o'clock in the morning, my student sent me a, a new result that I have as my second to last slide today. But um, so, so if you take most of these language learners, so, so um, things that are doing information extraction have gotten very, very powerful over the past few years. They're getting uh, what are called F1 metrics, precision versus recall, et cetera, et cetera, at 0 0.9, 0 0.93. But that doesn't mean the answers are 90% correct. It simply means something like nine out of 10 answers are correct. And that's not really true because it's much more complicated than that. But again, what it means is some of the things in the system are, wrong, are known to be wrong and we don't know which ones, right? So, so essentially, if I'm going to take the output of one of those and put it as input to another system, right, that system should know that maybe some of the stuff coming is wrong, right? So the traditional way we did it is we assume the reasoner that somewhere between the information extractor and putting it into a reasoner, something cleaned it up. Almost all of our data analytics, talk to anybody who really does data analytics in, in practice, and we all say the same thing, 80% of the challenge once you get past the legal issues of getting the data, 80% of the challenge is cleaning the data, right? And then running the analytics isn't that hard comparatively. And if you're pulling data from different places, it's integrating the data and cleaning it up. So, so we spend a lot of time dealing with the fact that we know the data is wrong and then using a lot of different techniques to clean it up, right? So that's another thing that I think is interesting. And the third one, the one that I'm really interested in and we're trying to look at is, both, both groups have talked for a long time about context, right? So, so context is, has been done by reasoners and things like that. So I was going to make this a very interactive part of the talk, but I'm running out of time, so I'll do it quickly. But let's say you want, if I ask you the question, what is the relationship between this man and this woman? Can anyone answer that question right now? They're dancing together. Might be a mother and son. Those of you who got mother and son, hold that because Everyone else will get that soon, <laughs> right? Okay, so we've actually built a system that can get that part of the stuff out. This is a, a recent publication of one of my grad students. If we didn't have this at the bottom, you could see the citation. It's, it's, uh, his name is Matt Clowen. It's Clowen and Himes, 2018, so it'll be at, presented at Hitchcock next month. But they basically created a GAN type approach, generative adversarial network that is doing the state of the art in this kind of, turning this kind of scene into this kind of stuff. So this is a woman wearing a dress that is blue is next to a man who wear, is wearing a shirt that is white, right? And, and a lot of this visual scene graph stuff, there's test case and things like that, and none of them do very well. Ours does as well or actually better than most people's. But he's done some stuff to put in these relationships. Um, wearing next to things like that. So most of these systems either just come out with triples, but they can't put them together. So if I had three or four people in the picture, it would just say a man in a white shirt, a man in a blue shirt, a man in the red shirt, and you can't tell whether that's one man, two men, three men, or the, you, things like that. So these are some, he is a kind of very complicated system. It uses both recursion and convolution and all the deep learning stuff, really cool things. But okay. Now, if I ask you what is the relationship between the man and the woman, I show you this, 
I hope more of you will get mother and son because that woman back there who's wearing a wedding dress gives you some context that this is probably a wedding. And if you know that at a wedding, the, um, you know, the, one of the traditions is the groom dancing with his mother, you would not only say this is mother and son, but this is mother and son at a wedding. For, and so you're using your background knowledge and this little bit of, so, so again, the current systems we have, it would add, and there's a woman in the white dress in back. Now, now again, we could theoretically give it lots and lots of wedding pictures, anyway, but then I would add another fact. I would say, well, you know, what if, um, you know, what if at an earlier time you had seen a different person standing next to the bride in front of the, uh, the preacher or whoever? Right, then you would probably say, okay, so this isn't the groom, this must be someone else dancing with, with a, a parent or an older woman or whatever, et cetera, et cetera. Right, so again, we can always seem to add a little bit to, to, to tweak these things. So, <clears throat> so how do we add that background knowledge? So what we're trying to do is take these scene grabs and start to feed them into reasoners. So the reason this is important is because there's a lot of domains where the significant reasoning needs these kind of relationships. This is a real example from one of the projects that we do not yet have even close to working, but are trying desperately to do. So lots of people have been looking at doing analysis of x-rays and CAT scans and things like that using deep learning, typically giving it the entire diagnosis against the entire picture. But what, what we've learned in talking in, at looking at some of the cases where there's a lot of problems is that it's exactly these kind of relationships that make the difference. So in these two different pictures, in this one, the person does not have cancer and often would be said to have cancer. And this one, the person does have cancer and typically would be told not to have cancer, right? So if you, if you had someone who wasn't a really trained, so these are two very hard images. Now, I don't know enough about the actual diagnostic part to tell you anything other than what it says on the bottom, but Essentially, not background knowledge about these two women would tell you different things about these images, even though both of them have what typically looks like the, the, this thing here that the white arrow is pointing at in that picture, right? You see there's one of those over there too, right? So that's the thing that gets reasoned about differently based on the relations to other things in the picture. So we need that stuff next to, uh, under, around. But we also need some of that background knowledge that this patient has previously had mastectomy and this one hasn't, things like that. So that's where we're trying to go. So, you know, all I can say is stay tuned. We hope we're gonna be able to get some good results. But again, we know we can't do this with either traditional AI or deep learning alone we're pretty sure we need to put some of that stuff together. We need to somehow get the features and relations into a form that the diagnostic system can use correctly. Um, so that's what I mean by context, right? More information, different information. So pretty much what, what, when, I, when I try to summarize that piece of it, and this is where I used to end, Context is key. So AI learning systems perform best in well-defined context, what they've been trained for. So if I train it with a lot of wedding pictures, they'll get weddings right, but nothing else, or only things that are a lot like wedding. If I train it on driving, it won't do well on, on weddings, right? So, so, so what you train your, so most of these things that are reporting very high performance rates are talking about with respect to the exact domain they were trained on. A really good example of this, some students of mine did a task where they took pictures of a bunch of buildings on campus and they showed that the system could, uh, you know, reliably tell which picture, which building it was. And on our campus, a lot of the buildings looked the same. It was a really nice piece of deep learning. But then I said, okay, now you this picture. And I showed them a picture of the squirrel, right? And they said, that's Sage Hall, <laughs> right? They went back, they retrained it, adding, all the pictures they had before, plus a lot of things that weren't buildings. The overall rate went way higher in terms of what it could get, the actual exact uh, ability to get the camp. So in other words, it no longer, it would say squirrels weren't buildings, but occasionally now it would confuse Sage Hall with Russell Hall, which are two buildings on our campus that look identical. So, so again, the, 
if all you want is something that's going to tell the buildings and you don't need to worry about what it's going to do with the other things, you would go one way. If you want something that was a little more general, you'd go the other way. And these are important things for us to understand. And humans are great at that. And all of these systems are, are bad at that. And there's some other famous things. But again, you need to take these things into account and add this extraneous information like we did with the information that's right. I'm just going to take one second to show you something else. This is the one that literally came last night. So the other thing we've been looking at is could we learn basic inferencing? And I had one of my students who very stubbornly told me we could, and I said, there's no way that's ever going to work. And I, I'm happy to say for the first time in a while, one of my students has proved me completely wrong, or not completely, mostly wrong. So it's taken a while to figure out an encoding and stuff like that. So we can now take these RDF graphs. So. Um, Essentially, what you would put into your ontology is something that says something like, if you take a course, you're a student, right? And the question is, could we learn some of those kind of relationships? So given a bunch of information for which we knew the, the relationships, then given a new thing, could it correctly categorize it? So in other words, would it make the correct kind of domain and range or something? And we can do some other things too. So showing that he could build a reasoner out of deep learning that could do simple reasoning was pretty easy. The only problem is it wasn't as good as a traditional reasoner, right? And so the papers were coming back saying, so who cares? Well, the answer is we cared because of that whole noisy data issue. So this is uh, still very preliminary. We're just getting there. But the blue line here, it, it, the blue and red line are, given a bunch of facts, does the thing make the right inferences, right? And um, it's against a well-known test domain, the Lehigh benchmark. And what we're doing is here we've added noise, so we've made some of the stuff wrong, right? So at 100%, the, the traditional reasoner does a little bit better than our reasoner. But when you start adding noise, our reasoner does terrible, but the traditional reasoner does way, way worse. So we think we're starting to see something interesting here. Again, this will be... <clears throat> This is kind of the end of a first doctoral thesis in this area, because most of the work was figuring out how you could get, getting, getting that, that blue line near 100 was a significant amount of, of research. But then showing that it's more noise resistant naturally follows, and that's what we were after. So again, this is, you know, stay tuned. I hope we're going to be able to do it. A lot of what, what's interesting about this is, uh, you know, again, it's a fast-changing world, so this deep learning stuff. My student had not figured out how to solve a per particular problem. There was a paper in KDD that showed him how to solve the, you know, a better way to encode the thing that worked much better for his system, and then it was able to actually start performing much better. But the problem is you're not getting papers that are telling you how to put these things together. And so, in a sense, to sum up my whole talk, what we're really trying to do is say, how do we make it so that that blue line goes up, we can feed it into other things, et cetera. Yeah, I'm, I'm just coming to the end, so I'll take, yeah, sure, go ahead. Can you explain real quick what the graph sure. word is? I didn't understand. I'm sorry? What, can you explain real quick what is a graph word? I didn't understand. Uh, I, um, uh, so, so there's like a number, another 10 slides before this, and I just grabbed this one quickly. So, so essentially what a graph word is, is you have to encode the data into a graph. That graph has to be a finite size because you're training a deep learning net. You can't have it be arbitrary, right? And there's ways of, of folding these things. So you say these patterns are very similar. So, all, so um, if you're a student and you're taking 20 classes, I can say, you fit the category student and you fit the category takes courses and there I've, I've just done a reduction. Uh, so takes course becomes a graph word for anybody who is a participant in any of these courses kind of thing. Because from an inference level, that's you know, the same thing. And again, a lot of this is still hand encodings. A lot of this is still very complicated as with most of these systems. So to finish, uh, this is what I've said over and over again. You know, modern AI is doing some amazing things but we still need the old kind of AI. And what we really need is to rethink how we bring together, how we bring these things together so that we talk about not grounding in symbols, but grounding in features and micro features. How do we explain what's going on? And how do we start taking context into effect so that we can, 
either do that in a feed forward way, so now the scene graph goes to the reasoner, or maybe it's a backward chaining thing, so the thing goes back and says, uh, you know, hmm, given what I'm seeing there, maybe it's a wedding, do you see any other wedding evidence? And maybe that's the same system or a different one. Again, so, you know, um, <clears throat> the philosophy I'm taking right now is we don't know how to put these things together. However we put them together, we're gonna get really, you know, sort of poorly engineered systems. But the best way to get a well-engineered system is to analyze a poorly engineered system and fix it. So that's what my lab is now trying to do is some of these hybrid things and looking both at real world problems that motivate this and at these kind of bottom up techniques like that last one to say, could we get there? And, and hopefully over the next couple of years, we'll be putting more of those together to try to solve these problems. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm very interested in uh, the last result that you suggested, uh, where you increase the noise and the system can do better in that case than humans. And I, I wondered if you look at, I, I study deception uh, in spying and how uh, you can interfere with the signal uh, to make it look like it's a signal when in fact it is noise. Uh, and one of the examples I, I use with my students uh, is uh, the, that some humans are colorblind and they are used, uh, they were used at least by the Air Force in uh, Vietnam War uh, right. to spot camouflage because they can't be fooled. And otherwise, the, right. in other words, the, the noise of the jungle is muted against their ability to see. Right. Uh, and the high incidence of colorblindness in uh, Native Americans, uh, so a lot of them yep, ended yep, up yep. getting used. Yep. They're also women who have an extra comb who can see more color so they can uh, protect their children better. They recognize bad food a little more easily. Hmm. I wonder if, if, right. you, if there are uh, ways that humans have adapted. Right. So let me, so the question is essentially, um, turning a lot of this question into sort of signal versus noise. Humans, different perception systems will let them see different things in the signal and noise. And so this notion that, you know, I have this reasoner that's doing better in the noisy system is really interesting. Now, let me say that that bottom line was not a person that was a symbolic reasoner. Comparing these things to people right now would be exceedingly hard because we're really just looking at, given this massive amount of facts and you get it right, I think. But that said, um, you know, I think you ask good questions. In fact, there's um, a piece of work that I'm not doing, I was actually asked to look into and we just didn't have the capability in my lab, was from a, um, one of the agencies <clears throat> saying, okay, so here's the problem. Within a few years, when you walk past the store window, they're gonna recognize your face, turn it to your buying habits and show you a custom advertisement for the people walking by, right? <clears throat> we have people who we'd rather not have recognized by those systems. What's the minimal changes you could make so that people went, well, there's some evidence now, so this is a whole very active field of the deep learning stuff, is how do you, um, so I don't know how many of you have seen the famous example of what's called adversarial learning, but you take a picture of, of something, so um, something like, it's a gorilla, right? And then you, you, you take a tiny amount of noise and, and add that to the picture. And a human sees very little different. And the deep learning system gets it completely wrong. That's a sloth or whatever. Uh, there's a famous one, which is a dog and an ostrich. And I forget exactly why. But again, it, it's, and so there's arguments that these things are very thin. And again, a lot of the people who are critical of deep learning systems say, you know, if, if they're gonna have this kind of fragility, we'll never be able to really use them. And then, uh, you know, I, I mentioned that thing called a, a GAN, a generative adversarial, adversarial network. People are actually now building that kind of noise tester into their networks to defeat that in advance. But again, we, so it, it's a very active field of how do we know what the features inside the thing are 
and, and how can they be useful? In fact, the, the student who's doing that one with the scene graphs, that's really what he's trying to do. We're trying to be able to go back. So there's a famous picture of like a dog playing a guitar, right? And if you look at the sort of intermediate levels of the neural network and ask it to find the most salient things, you get a picture which shows you sort of a dog face and the guitar and then a couple other spots. So the idea would be, see, it's a dog and guitar. But of course, that's not symbolic. So a system to understand that that was dog and that was guitar would still need to be a vision processing system. With these scene graphs, we're actually trying to say, you know, when you said the man was wearing a white shirt or, or was next to somebody or, you know, the lung was, um, you know, above the other thing, we'd like to actually say, could you kind of explain that in a simple sense of explain? So what features convince you of that, right? Was the fact that the bride was in the background important or not? Was the fact that they were near each other? And again, very simple stuff. We're, we're really at the beginning of this, but it's sort of, can you do pro symbolic provenance against these um, numeric learners? And if so, then I think a lot of the kind of questions you're asking become the next really interesting set of questions. So, okay, are those good features? If those are the features that it's, so again, it was getting the buildings right, but it couldn't get the squirrel. When we added the squirrel, it did much better overall, but it did worse on a couple of the buildings. Is there a way we could sort of go in there as it was in microsurgery and fix it? Or, you know, do what we would do with a human and say, you know, what special, what, what extra training would we give to this person to be able to do it? So, uh, you know, the Air Force, because they didn't have enough colorblind people, actually had those people help train other people. What are you looking at? What do you notice that I'm not seeing? And then those other people didn't get as good. And again, I know that real that particular example, but there's other examples that are very similar to that. So I spent some time with the Air Force. <laughs> so, yeah. So, I mean, it's a great question. The answer is I've just given you a long answer that was a very complicated way of saying, I don't know. Because it sounds like the... Uh heuristics that humans are using. <coughs> a lot of those are words. Uh, so the example given by, uh, I'm having problems with names, uh, uh, who writes about pocket devices, interesting devices, uh, Kahneman. Kahneman, yeah. The, the, the uh, fireman who has a lot of experience, who knows from that experience, when the ceiling's going to fall in, yep. and if you actually sat down and asked him, he would tell he could tell you, as you said, it would take a long time to explain it. Uh, yeah, I'm going to take. I, what, let me let me take some other questions. I'd be happy to continue this after because I think you're asking about something phenomenally interesting. Is there another question? Someone else? Has, yeah. I'm a software developer for the university, so this may be beyond the scope of what we We're kind of experimenting right now with. Uh, introducing some intelligent interfaces into existing university systems. And really quickly, I'm kind of seeing this distinction between uh, AI that knows things for me and AI that can do things for me. And they feel like very different problem domains to me. And I'm wondering, are they, in your opinion, or does it just feel that way because of the state of current technology? Yeah, so the question was, you know, sort of I see these AI systems that can kind of do things for me and, and things that as I said, can help me do things. And are these the same, different? And the answer is, that's a really interesting question, right? Um, so I've been talking primarily about, you know, the interface between two different kinds of AI system, but the interface between humans and these modern AI systems is another fascinating area a lot of people are looking into. Um, my fast answer would be there's not a lot of deep results yet, but there's a lot of interest in exploring this. And again, you know, um, the, the simple example I give you is I have a friend who has a lot more money than I have, and he drives a Tesla. He said the most interesting thing about driving a Tesla was he has to learn when to let the car drive and when to drive himself. And, and so, so it was kind of a mutual training. But now he's pretty good at it. So like when he goes somewhere, he knows when I hit a, a city I haven't driven through a lot, you know, paths I haven't been on before, I'll typically drive. When I'm somewhere I've been off in or when I'm out on the highway, I'll let the Tesla drive. I said, you know, how hard and fast are those rules? And he said, a good start, right? Because again, he's a human and what'll happen is he'll say, you know, this particular 
the highway situation is making me nervous. Maybe I'll drive. But um, so, so the auto driving car can do things for him, but also is doing things with him. And a lot of the stuff the car companies are wrestling with now is who's in control of what, when, and how do we do and things like that. And I think there's a whole level of that because we're used to assume, assuming the computer is sort of an assistant. You know, it processes a lot of data and it gets me some regularity quickly. But now it can be in an interactive thing. The question is, as it were, who's driving when? And, you know, again, I, I could talk a lot about it, but I really would be not telling you anything very useful. But there are, if you look at some of the human-computer interaction literature now, there's starting to be more of that. Yeah, in the back. Sorry. I was just wondering, that the, looking at the Gartner hype cycle, if you're familiar with that, I've seen the deep learning point actually going downward. Uh, spiral towards the yep. spiral, uh, but th this is just a comment on the side. There's an ongoing debate, and your talk here absolutely resonates well on the fact that this is driven by a colleague from NYU, for example, Gary Marcus, who has uh, engaged the entire DL community in a very heated debate about the role yep. of DL and where the limits are. He's basically saying that DL is dead unless it merges with symbolic systems, symbolic processing, and traditional AI. And um, that's a very interesting thing. I mean, he's basically emitting a paper yep. on a weekly basis on archive. Yep. Um, and, and so on. I would recommend reading that. Yeah, so definitely. So what, what you're doing is, is what, what I think one, one important aspect is, is actually um, merging modalities, right? So we are actually, yes. as, as biological intelligence systems, um, taking input, taking data from multimodal channels, and uh, all the AI systems, all the deep learning systems that I'm looking at, I actually just looking at one. And the fact is, for example, it was pointed out, attributed by, to a colleague here at IU in psychology, Linda Smith, she made the observation that in the Google corpus, web corpus, you would not find a single example of an orange carrot. It's not mentioned as a bigram language. In fact, what you find is pink and purple carrots, and this is because language is that way. You mentioned the case that are exceptional. Right. Um, but on the other hand, if you look at pictures in YouTube and everywhere else on Google, you will see that all carrots are orange, actually. Right. So the, the next thing that we would have to do is really merge these modalities together for our knowledge representation, yep. whatever way we treat it symbolic or in yeah, I'm going to steal that carrot example. That's, that goes in this talk next time, so thank you. But no, you're absolutely right. In fact, Gary and I have known each other for a while, and we exchange emails and fight on Facebook and things like that, although now we mostly agree, so it's good. But um, I'm going down to see him probably in another, I forget whether it's February, March, and looking very forward to it because, you know, again, he comes from more of a philosopher and cognitive view saying, hey, there's problems here. And I come from more of an engineering view saying, so let's build systems that overcome those problems, even if they're you know, going to be a step at a time. That should become a research paradigm. And um, I think by and, and, and in fact, there's a very interesting conversation that's been going on between me, Gary, and Jan LeCun in a, an email thread about this. Because interesting, Gary and Jan agree about a lot of the technical stuff, but obviously have, so Jan LeCun is, is sort of one of the fathers of um, deep learning, is very heavily involved in Facebook's deep learning, also at NYU where Gary is. And they're, um, you know, I sort of said to Jan, the, the dog uh, duck one, uh, the, the duck cat one, and said dog versus, he said, look, if I could get an AI that was good as a dog, I'm happy. Right. So he doesn't try to claim. So he says, you know, if we're ever going to get to human intelligence, we would have to have lots more unsupervised and lots of things. And he kind of hedges his bet about whether he's saying we could or couldn't. But but it's still along the lines of we can't do it with the current technology suite. Right. But he would pretty much argue that the stuff I'm trying to do with the symbolic AI, he wants to eventually replace with with more brain-like mechanism because, um, you know, years ago, I was, I was going into an early neural network, this meeting, it must have been about 1988, and Pat Hayes, who's a famous logician, some many of you have heard of, was, was there, and I said, Pat, what are you doing in a neural network thing? He said, well, you know, I don't really like this stuff, but I have an existence proof that it works, <laughs> right? Now, again, our systems are still way different than brains, so that's the other thing that, that 
many people point out, including Gary. You know, we, we keep talking about the biological inspiration behind neural nets, but boy, there are no neurotransmitters. There are no uh, long connections. There are, we have, there's, there's no long-term memory equivalent, although there are some models that name things long-term memory because they keep it for more than three training cycles, right? That's not like, like when I ask you, what was the name of your second grade teacher? And you, after a while, actually figure that out, you know, that kind of thing. So very complicated and very different and a lot of interesting stuff in there. So, so again, I think, you know, I, I would say that philosophically, we all are sort of on the same page. Research approach is completely different. And that's part of what makes this game so fun as a researcher. Do you, do you have a question from someone online? Okay. Do you think it's possible to teach an AI system to ask for more context? So for example, instead of trying to match a building with squirrel pictures and say, you know, it's something I haven't seen before. Tell me more about it. Yeah, so um, there are certainly people who are looking at that kind of thing. The problem is, right now you don't have a mechanism that says, tell me more about it. So you all heard the question, so I should probably repeat it for the people online. Was The question was essentially, you know, um, could we build these systems so that they would actually know when they were at their limits and then would ask for more information? And the answer is maybe. We certain, there are certain people talking about it. But again, one of the problems is how do you ask for more information? So the building system, seeing things it was getting wrong, would A, need to know it's getting them wrong, so it's some kind of feedback mechanism, and two, the students had to go take all those pictures together and retrain. They couldn't just add the new ones and say, not a building, not a building, not a building, because the system builds the weights, the deep learning system builds the entire solution as, as a whole. Now, there are some people looking at modular. So, so what I'd say is there's a known problem there. There's not really a lot of solutions. Most of the people do, doing deep learning, and in fact, it's part of why I think it's here on the hype cycle. By the way, I'd point out that the semantic web was, was down at the pits a few years ago. Now is on the upswing again, so I'm happy. But um, again, you know, I think a lot of this stuff has to come together, and part of what happens is one of these mechanisms starts to become very powerful gets a lot of hype, starts to show it can't meet that hype, and a lot of disappointment happens. But meanwhile, there are other mechanisms we understand that might help. So I think I wouldn't say it's so much that the system should be able to say, can you add some context? But it's probably that the system might, should be against some kind of background knowledge. So um, I mentioned the one about the ostrich and the dog. And so one of the things one of my students was looking at and actually led to that noisy reasoner, and we never went back to the original question, was that was one of the adversarial examples. So you actually see lots of pictures of, people, of a man walking dog, and one picture where a man is actually walking an ostrich. I have no idea where this picture came from, right? So sometimes once you've trained it, you get pictures of where it says, I think that's a man walking a dog and it's actually the ostrich, and you get a lot of occasional times where it says, I think that's a man walking an ostrich and it's really one of the dogs, but usually, when it was wrong, they were very close to each other. And when it was right, they were very far from each other. So you, you could imagine a system that could say, you know, I'm, I think it's X, but I'm not sure you other system, could you help me? Or is there something we could bring in that might resolve it or something? So, so understanding that you're not getting something right is a challenge. But if you could, you could then actually start looking at that. So I think whoever asked that, I, I hope you're either you know, a researcher studying it or a doctoral student looking for that as a project, because that's a really good question, is how we would do that. And the question is whether you would do that within the network or the associative systems, et cetera, or whether you would do it as another module that can be brought in at the right time. And if you do that, you're attacking exactly the kind of questions I was talking about today. The master's student, and they say thank you. Yes. Go for it. Great question. <laughs> and learning to ask the right question is more important than, than sometimes than learning to generate the right answers. Last question, I guess. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm not There's no bad questions. Um, 
I'm driving to the found that I have to be trained by the machine to work with the machine. But, you know, that raises a very interesting question. If, if it's just a context issue, then we're down, it seems to me, we're back down issues of signal. Okay, but if I'm driving through the city, I want a perspective. I want the perspective of the other people. I want the perspective of even the dog. And what, if this sounds crazy, but what is the perspective of the animal system? Yeah, so the question is essentially, you know, <clears throat> something very related to context is the notion of perspective, right? So, so um, <clears throat> in another version, another talk I have that has a piece of this in it, <clears throat> when I really do go through the Jeopardy thing, you know, what's interesting is I could not have played that game against either Watson or Ken Jennings for my life. But I actually took all of the questions and the three top answers that Watson had, which were shown on the show, I made that into a declarative thing, and I actually showed it to students. The students all do better than either Watson or Ken Jennings did by themselves, right? So you, are, you would be able, given the, the question, and three answers that are usually include the correct answer, but not necessarily as the top, would say, no, that second one is right. right? Some of them, of course, are all wrong and, and things like that. But, but so me and Watson, and ignore the time issue, right, could have gotten more questions correct than either of them got by themselves. And that, I think, is exactly that perspective thing. And I think that goes back to the question that was asked before, about putting humans and computers together in new ways. Because the question is, if the pair of us is more powerful, or again, in medical diagnosis, a lot of things that show they take one doctor, one computer, two doctors, and a doctor and a computer, and in virtually every case testing diag well-known diagnostic suites, the doctor and the computer outperform any of the other three. Now again, that's, that's in a test situation, and it's not perfect, but Somehow humans and computers together, and I think, and in fact, it's, it's the point of our book, <clears throat> we end with, you know, looking at the foreseeable future, it's going to be humans doing what humans do well, computers doing what computers do well, and then figuring out how do we put these things together so that the combination improves everybody's performance. And that, that's, you know, what people are talking about now, revolutionizing healthcare, Revolution financial services, the auto car. I mean, you know, all of that stuff that's new companies starting, almost all of them are figuring out how do I keep a human in the loop at the right time? And so that's, you know, another whole area that I think is really exciting and interesting. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much.